Good evening. My name is Natalie Mead. I'm the Associate Curator at the Hunter Museum of American Art. Thank you so much for joining us this evening um, for an introduction and sneak peek to our latest exhibition, Under Construction, Collage from the Mint Museum, which will be on view at the Hunter Museum starting tomorrow, January 29th through April 18th. We start off this evening by recognizing and thanking our generous sponsors, EMJ Construction and Wells Fargo, whose support has made this exhibition possible, as well as Martha Mackey for her continued sponsorship of ArtWise programs like this evening's lecture. Whether this is your first time attending a virtual program at The Hunter, or you have attended programs with us in the past, welcome. Please take a moment to let us know where you are from, say a quick hello in the chat box on the side of your screen. And if you have any questions during the lecture this evening, please type them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. As a reminder, not only can you rewatch tonight's program, which is being recorded, but you can check out past ArtWise programs, performances, lectures, and artist talks on our YouTube channel. Just search for Hunter Museum. If you are just tuning in now, my name is Natalie Mead, and I want to welcome you to this evening's ArtWise behind the scenes exploration of our latest exhibition, Under Construction, Collage from the Mint Museum. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to the curator of this very clever exhibition, Dr. Jonathan Stillman, the Mint Museum's Senior Curator of American Art. Before joining the Mint as the Curator of American Art in 2006, Jonathan Stillman worked at the prestigious Norton Museum of Art, the University of Virginia Art Museum, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and the Art Institute of Chicago. While at the Mint, he has organized numerous traveling exhibitions, contributed to many accompanying of exhibition catalogs and oversaw the installation of the Mint Museum's collection of American art for the opening of the Mint Museum Uptown in 2010. Dr. Stolman is also the curator of this remarkable new exhibition at the Hunter Museum, Under Construction. Under Construction celebrates the dynamic medium of collage, featuring over 30 international artists and nearly 100 works of art this exhib exhibition explores the technique of collage and the ways the medium impacted other forms of art like painting, printmaking, photography, and assemblage. I look forward to learning more about this medium and this remarkable exhibition, and I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Jonathan Stillman here tonight. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you, Natalie. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, Thank you so much to everyone joining us. I see we have more than 75 participants, which is wonderful after 10 months of Zoom um, <laughs> to see that the people are still interested in learning and don't have Zoom fatigue too badly. And also um, in the comments, seeing lots of people not from Chattanooga, which is really great. So you, you guys are really doing a terrific job attracting um, digital audiences from all over. Um, I'd like to join Natalie in um, and, and thank Natalie, um, first of all, and her colleagues, Adara and Nandini and the Hunter's director, um, Virginia Sharber, for hosting this exhibition. Um, it's, it's one that we're thrilled to get out and about and to help um, our collection be better known and to share with uh, audiences all around the country. And I'd also like to thank um, Martha Mackey, who sponsored this series, and Wells Fargo, who not only sponsored um, the show here at the Mint, um, but also as it's traveled around to different venues across the country. And as I'll mention, um, also helped us to acquire a few of the pieces in the show. So they've been fantastic supporters of the arts, um, both here and, and across the country. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna jump into my presentation and start sharing my screen. So Natalie asked me if I would just give a little bit of background about the Mint and, and tell people uh, about it for just a moment. So. I will, thought I would do that. Um, on the upper left there, you can see the Mint's original building. Uh, we get our name um, because we actually, the building originally, um, made money. It was the first U.S. Mint outside of Philadelphia. There was a gold rush here in North Carolina in the 1840s. And um, so they started uh, minting money in, in Uptown Charlotte 
around that time. Uh, by the 1930s, um, that building that you see there was had been decommissioned and was about to be torn down. And a group of um, women leader, leaders in Charlotte decided that not only did they want to save this historic building, but also that there was kind of a burgeoning art scene in the city at the time, and they felt that Charlotte should have a proper art museum. And so they raised $900 to move the building brick by brick um, out to what was then a horse field, a horse pastures um, in a neighborhood outside of downtown Charlotte and to reconstruct it and open it as an art museum. And so it opened in 1936 as the first art museum in the state. Um, if you, the image down below um, is actually kind of the front of the museum as you see it today, although it's the back of the building up top, it kind of mirrors that architectural form. Um, the, the, the building was expanded um, in the 1960s and again in the 1980s, um, and it has a really nice park-like setting around it. Um, throughout the kind of the 90s into the early 2000s, um, the, Min the, the downtown of Charlotte was really starting to blossom and the Mint was really trying to find a way to have a presence there. We opened a museum of craft and design in the late 1990s, um, but in the early 2000s had the opportunity as the, the downtown area continued to grow to um, become part of what's known as the Levine Center for the Arts, which features not only the Mint's new uptown building, which you see on the right there, um, but also um, the Gantt Center for African-American Art, the Beckler Museum of Modern Art, and also on the Knight Theater. Uh, so there's a small kind of arts complex for any who have visited Charlotte there uptown. Um, the Mint Museum Randolph, as we call it, because it's on Randolph Road, the original building, um, now currently houses our collections of decorative arts, um, of African art, of ancient American art, um, our small collection of European paintings, and a couple of other um, collections uh, like that. The Uptown Museum now contains our collections of craft and design, uh, as well as our collections of American art and modern and contemporary art, um, although things do go back and forth between the two. Um, but those are just a little bit of background um, for the museum itself. So this show really grew out of um, a couple of um, previous exhibitions that we had done uh, where we really decided that we wanted to dive more deeply into the collection and to show parts of the collection that didn't make it out uh, on view as often as others or that needed to be rotated frequently um, because of their sensitivity to light. Um, and we also wanted, uh, we'd been in our new building about five years by the time that we started doing this series and we um, were looking for ways to celebrate not only our collection, but those who had helped to build it over the years. Um, so the first show that came in this kind of small series was um, Works on Paper from the American Collection, which we did in uh, 2015. Um, the second of these, um, called Here and Now, uh, looked at photography from the museum's collection. And both you know, Works on Paper and Photography, um, we don't have a dedicated gallery for either of these at, at the building currently. Um, so they do get integrated into the permanent collection display a little bit, but we do need to rotate those collections fairly frequently, um, which um, does cause a lot of wear and tear on the staff um, to kind of keep up with those rotations um, so that the objects aren't on display in the light for too long. Um, so that we thought this was a really nice opportunity to kind of gather um, all of the collections that had grown over the past 80 years or so and, and to really kind of show um, what they had come to be during that time. Um, neither of those exhibitions traveled, however, and the current exhibition, uh, under construction grew out of some conversations that I had with our former curator of contemporary art, Brad Thomas, um, about um, how we could look at um, the medium of collage within our collection. And the reason that, so here's under construction as it um, appeared in the Mint's galleries um, a couple of years ago when it first opened there. Um, now, the reason that we were so interested in collage is because of this gentleman on the screen here, uh, that's Romar Bearden. And Romar Bearden uh, was a Charlotte native uh, grew up in the city um, as a child and then moved um, to New York City, to Pittsburgh for a while, and then back to New York. Um, but Bearden really became known as one of, um, if not the, um, leading practitioners of collage during the second half of the 20th century. He really rejuvenated the medium and, um, and brought it into the present and inspired many other artists, I think, working in that medium as well. And so there's a, a great image of him there on the left and then on the right at work in his studio. Now what you see, there's a photograph on the wall above his work table there. That's actually a photograph of his great grandparents taken on their porch um, in what is, 
it's actually not now not that far from where the Mint Museum Uptown is. Um, so he, even though Bearden left Charlotte as a child, um, Charlotte kind of claims him for its own. Uh, he always um, returned back to visit family. He consistently in his work referenced themes of, um, of the South and of Charlotte in particular in his work. And so um, the Mint uh, was one of the first museums to do a retrospective of his work in the 1980s and has hosted multiple exhibitions since then. Um, we currently, I believe, still have um, the largest museum collection of his work. Um, it's roughly 65 or so objects, everything ranging from collages, of course, to um, many prints and drawings, paintings, uh, and other things. We do keep a gallery dedicated at our Uptown Museum um, to Bearden's work, so we always are kind of shuffling through those works in the in the collection to try to offer new perspectives on Bearden's life and art. This is a, a shot of, of the Bearden Gallery at the Mint Museum Uptown. Which brings us to collage. Um, now, Bearden um, certainly wasn't the first artist to dive into the medium of collage. As I mentioned, I think he can be pretty credited with, with really rejuvenating interest in it um, starting in the 1960s. Um, but collage was, was, if we think about it broadly, was a medium that had been practiced by artists um, dating back hundreds, if not thousands of years, um, all the way back to um, uh, artists in, in ancient Asia who, were, who would um, collage in um, signatures and different bits of text into, into poems and, and other images, um, all the way up through the Victorian era where there were kind of um, romantic uh, collages made with, with photographs and other things, but it really kind of entered back into the fine art world uh, in the early years of the 20th century, um, kind of most broadly credited to Picasso and Brock and the Cubists. So on the, on the left there you see an early collage by George Brock with kind of a classic example of the medium um, where he's combining drawing, um, some paper with a texture drawn on it, a snippet of newspaper, uh, and layering them together. And and the term collage comes from the French word uh, coller, which means to paste or to glue. Uh, collage was actually called papier coller, or, or glued or pasted papers originally. That's where the, the term comes from. Um, and so you can see there in, in Brock's still life uh, with Tenora from 1913, the Museum of Modern Arts collection, um, how all of this is starting to come together with the cubist aesthetic. And I love the way that he's, he's we'll, we'll talk about text uh, and collage a little bit later, but he's, so that the tenora is a kind of oboe-like instrument, which you can see drawn in pencil there. Um, if I move my cursor here, um, there's the, the instrument with its finger holes. Um, so he's, I liked how he's pasted above that, um, the word leco, um, so kind of referencing the reverberating tones of music. So kind of calling to mind a different, some different senses with the use of text, opening up new, new kinds of readings and, and meanings for the painting. Um, and collage was picked up on by artists for many movements um, after Cubism. On the right is a kind of classic example by Hannah Hoch, who was a artist involved with the, the Dada movement in Germany. Uh, and you can see her bringing together images from all kinds of different uh, newspapers and other sources there um, with the word Dada kind of questioning um, this kind of nonsensical combination of images. Um, and Dada is kind of a nonsense word. Um, derived from the kind of the babbling sounds an infant might make. Um, so that's kind of an example of a, a movement right after um, Cubism that, that started to pick it up and we'll see others after that um, shortly that did as well. Now what Bearden did I think is really interesting. Um, in the earlier works, um, collage kind of adhered to Cubism's formal explorations of, of abstracting space and bringing different kind of subjects together and depicting them from many different angles and and kind of flattening out the space of a picture in interesting ways. Bearden, I think, really um, injected narrative back in, into collage. Um, you know, the Surrealists did it a little bit um, with their kind of subconscious and dream world fantasy narratives, but Bearden really tied it back to everyday experience. And so in this collage that's in the exhibition called The Train from 1974, um, he's bringing together um, both imagery from mass media um, combining images together to create the faces of a family. It's what you're seeing as a, a family group gathered within kind of a wooden um, a wooden tenement house-like structure. They're gathered around a table, sharing a meal, gathering together. Um, Bearden also, um, has, you see kind of a wonderful image of a, water a watermelon there in the lower left. Um, let's see, my mouse here, um, down there on the lower left, 
where he's just taken a piece of green paper and kind of painted upon it um, the pattern of the watermelon shell and the seeds. Um, so using not just um, visual uh, photographic type of imagery from newspaper sources, but other materials bring them together. And then there's the, the train uh, in the upper left there, kind of chugging by, which is a symbol of both comings and goings and migrations and also the location uh, of many of the neighborhoods that Bearden was familiar with uh, in Charlotte. Um, so he really kind of injected this new energy into kind of personal narratives into the medium of collage, uh, starting you know, roughly in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. So that was how we kind of came to the first section of the exhibition, which we called New Narratives. Um, here's another classic um, image by Bearden. It's one of the larger collages in the show and one of the, the um, kind of prizes of our collection uh, called Evening of the Gray Cat. And I think it's, it's fun to really, collages really encourage you to look closely, um, to explore the, the many different ways that artists were bringing together different imagery from different sources to create new meanings. Um, so even digging into some of the details of Evening of the Gray Cat here, this kind of really jam-packed interior scene, you can see, again, the different ways that Bearden is using his kind of artistic skills to create collage. In the figure of the guitar player on the left there, um, a lot of it's just done by cutting silhouettes, um, the man's face, the hat, the kerchief, um, and then combining those to create the image of the man playing the guitar. On the right, he's got um, a couple of different things going on. He's bringing in patterned papers um, to create patterns of the woman's shirt, for example, there, or um, the, the kind of carpet on the floor uh, with the, the red and white pattern there. Um, he's also bringing in literal imagery. So that kind of brush up on the shelf there is just a, you know, a brush that he's clipped from a, a newspaper or magazine somewhere. And then again, taking pieces of paper and painting on them to create other types of um, imagery. So you've got the, the watermelon there with its seeds painted on, um, the dog down below with its spots and it's kind of the shading for its body. Um, so he's really kind of combining lots of different artistic approaches within the medium of collage to create the image. Um, now, as I mentioned, the title of the painting is Evening of the Gray Cat. And it's really fun if you bring family or children to the show to find the gray cat and you'll eventually, some of you may have spotted him already, um, but if not, he's down there in the lower right, um, kind of on the tipped up uh, stool, kind of beard and drawing upon that cubist perspective of tipping up the, the surface of the, the stool in space, and he's got the gray cat curled up there on the stool. Um, other works in this section, um, I explore this idea of narrative from different angles. So here we've got a, a really fun piece by Haradina Pindell um, called Autobiography uh, East West Gardens. Um, this was a part of a series that Pindell created uh, when she had recently been in a car accident and was kind of dealing with its repercussions and um, suffering from brain injury and, and trying to kind of get back to her artistic practice and, and herself. And she wanted to kind of get out of her um, kind of familiar uh, surroundings in New York and, and to escape also the you know, racism and sexism that she encountered there as she was making her way in the art world. And so she had the ability to travel to Japan for um, a while. And so this is part of a series that she made there that gives you the title East West. And one of the things she enjoyed most about her time in Japan was the experience of escaping um, kind of the exterior world and exploring Japanese gardens. And so that gives the garden part of the title. And so this piece is actually made up of lots of postcards that she collected there and then cut up and layered on top of each other to create this really dynamic composition. Uh, so when you're able to see the show, you can look closely and see some of the different um, sources that she was using to create this piece. Um, I mentioned surrealism earlier um, as one of the um, artistic movements that really took to collage. Um, and there are some contemporary artists that I think operate very much in that surrealistic vein. And Nils Karsten is one of them. He's uh, currently living and working in New York. And um, there are a couple of pieces by him in our collection and, and in the show. And one of them in particular that's pretty powerful is this one called Ausbruch der Dufen. Uh, Karsten is, has a German background and basically that means outbreak of the idiots, if, if one was to translate it, um, or outbreak of the fools. And so already you've got this kind of nonsensical title uh, that accompanies kind of the craziness you see in the, uh, the large scale collage there on the left. Um, so down to the right, you can see this is Howard Ian of Pindell's piece. Um, this is a big piece by James Rosenquist that's maybe uh, seven or eight feet tall. So that gives you a sense of the scale of, of the Karsten, Karsten collage. I think um, if we compare what Karsten's doing here, you've got this kind of 
com composite fantastical figure floating in space here with a, a cowboy hat, an almost skeletal face, some kind of painted and collaged wings and body made up of different parts. And then this bird-like figure here that's also composed of everything from kind of claw-like hands in the body to a, a head there. Um, I'm comparing it here to um, two images from a book that was done by surrealist artist Max Ernst that was based on photo collages that he did. I think you can see how Ernst here um, is combining um, animal and human imagery as well himself. And so on, on the right, this kind of running male figure with a bird-like head. Um, here on the left, um, female figure and this um, man that's kind of fantastically bent over, um, convulsing on the ground, has a, an owl-like head in almost a snake-like form coming out of his mouth. Um, so I think you can see how, how Karsten is drawing on that kind of fantastical, um, crazy surrealist imagery uh, in his work. We do have some great um, process shots that he shared with us about how he made the piece. So you can see here's, a, here's the piece in one of its very early phases where he's got this uh, image of, of this face, the cowboy hat, one of the kind of wings, which here almost is like a cape and then the body's uh, kind of held together almost as it's tumbling through space. And then there's a, these other figures down below reaching upwards towards it. Um, Karsten collects all kinds of, uh, he snips things out of all different text sources and kind of keeps a little library of them. So here's some of his, um, all the different sources that he draws upon when he creates his collage works. Um, here you can see he's added some of those in, um, kind of hovering around this tumbling body through space. Now it gives a sense that it's connected to the figures below. He's painted a little bit more. Um, now he's changed the tumbling form of the body uh, into a wing and the figure is kind of floating downwards now, um, added in some more scenes. And there he is in front of the, the final piece. So it, it's, I love, I'll show you, share with you one or two other artist process um, images as we go through. Um, but it, I love being able to kind of see behind the process that leads to the creation of these works. It also gives you a sense of the scale of the piece as well. Um, and here you can see it installed. I will give you even a sneak, sneak peek. This is it installed in the Hunter's Gallery. Some of you may recognize that um, alongside two of the other stars in the show. This is, this is really a kind of amazing wall that they've created. Um, three really powerful works or four um, that are seen here on it, but three really large scale, great pieces. Um, on the left there, um, to the left of Nils Karsten's collage is the one I'll talk about next. Um, by Ndidi Emefile, who is a Nigerian slash um, London-based artist. She goes back and forth between the two. Um, interesting thing about this piece is that it wasn't actually in the Mint presentation of the show. Um, we actually acquired it uh, maybe a year or so after the exhibition opened. Uh, our director and I were walking through the art fair at the Armory uh, in New York, uh, I think spring of, of 2019. And came into the, the stall of a London dealer and saw these works by uh, Emma Fille. And we thought that they really, um, A, were just fabulous, um, fascinating works of art, and B, that they also you know, really related back to things that we had by Bearden and kind of carried on and expanded upon the collage tradition that Bearden had started. So what we're seeing here is Emma Fille um, kind of taking us inside of a salon in Nigeria um, that is both kind of abstract and figurative. Uh, if you see, um, you've got this, this kind of fantastical seated figure in the chair here, all kinds of um, fabric textures that are used um, on the piece uh, to create the figure's body. Um, the figure to, the, to her right um, has a, a broken CDs for her eyes. Um, the blow dryer here that we see up above, this kind of classic blow dry image, it's not trained down on the person in the chair, but kind of blowing the hair of the figure standing in a crazy way. Um, you've got painting mixed in, this kind of fi figure down in the lower left here, her head um, kind of disappears into this, this wonderful abstract area um, and more fabric uh, down below with beads and all sorts of other things. So um, I love the subject too. Um, so a little bit of research showed that salons were um, a source of, of really of, of power for women uh, in Nigeria, not just because it was a place where they could come together and gather um, um, in terms of social interaction, but salons are often one of the few types of businesses that um, women often owned and operated. So it's a source of kind of financial and economic um, strength for uh, women entrepreneurs as well. Um, so I think it, the piece really, it really functions on a number of, of great levels. 
Um, and I hope you all enjoy getting to see it in person. Um, so a lot of um, looking at collage, we, we tend to think of it as, um, especially when we look at Bearden's collages, as figurative or showing a certain kind of narrative. But there's actually a number of collages, both in our collection and in, out there in the world, um, where things become more, more abstract. Um, now, what was most surprising to me is that um, to discover that Romar Bearden had a brief period where he uh, experimented with abstraction as well um, in the early late 1950s and early 1960s. And so this piece on the left is actually it's on long-term loan to the museum, but we really wanted to include it uh, in the show. Bearden's a theme that kind of runs throughout many sections of the exhibition. Um, so here's an abstraction of his from 1961. And I want to show you, kind of compare it to a couple of um, other classic works of art, um, just to think about the ways in which Bearden is really um, not just kind of creating these things in a vacuum, but is really tied back to various parts of art history and was very aware of them. Um, so on the right is a, a, another kind of classic cubist collage by Pablo Picasso uh, from the Museum of Modern Art. But I think you can see pretty quickly both how Bearden is, is kind of referring to the geometric layered forms um, that artists like Picasso used um, when they were kind of re reintroducing collage into the art world, um, but also the palette that they often used, those blacks and black and whites and different shades of, of brown and gray. Um, he's very much um, drawing upon that history as well. I think he's also very um, conscious, obviously, um, of what's going on in the art world at the time and what the dominant um, kind of movement within the American art world was, um, which was abstract expressionism. And so um, I think he's in his collage, both referencing kind of the all over compositions that an artist like Picasso or his colleagues would have used in their work, that kind of an enveloping space. Um, although Bearden's isn't of the scale that the abstract expressionist work um, often reached, um, but that kind of all over composition. But then also just that energetic um, kind of sense of surface. If you look closely at this Bearden collage when you see it, um, it's a lot of the pieces that he's collaging are made of kind of different kinds of spattered and dripped ink uh, and paint on the paper and, and other materials. So I think he's, he's you know, directly referencing that movement. Now, this is going to seem a strange juxtaposition at first, but I think he's also um, in the little corner of the painting is also kind of referencing a very um, classical tradition within landscape painting. So I'm showing you the lower right hand bit of Bearden's collage. I'll go back, try to go back. It's down there um, on the lower right where that little bit of red comes in. Um, and that's, that's, I think, you know, maybe he's not directly referencing, but it's maybe somewhere in his consciousness um, that classic landscape painters, here's a Thomas Gainsborough's landscape in Suffolk um, from the 18th century, would often include a little figure in red down there in the foreground, both to provide kind of visual relief from the browns and greens and blues of the rest of the, of the painting, but also to kind of anchor the viewer's eye down there to give the viewer something to kind of relate to. It's often you know, a figure down there in the foreground. And so I think with Bearden's um, composition, he's got this little bit of red down there in the lower right that serves the same purpose. It provides relief from kind of having the overall tonality of the collage um, just be kind of browns and grays. It gives it that little bit of a, a pop. It sets it apart. Um, and I think that, you know, don't know for sure, but I would suspect that comes from his knowledge of, um, of earlier historical landscape painting. because he was very much a student of art history. Go there. Uh, another um, bit of abstraction that you'll see in the show, and if you're a careful observer, you will call us out and say, this isn't really a collage. Um, there's a series of, of prints made by the um, surrealist and Dada artist Man Ray that we've included in the exhibition um, that he did. It's uh, from a series called Revolving Doors. Um, this one's called The Meeting. And what originally happened with this, it was a series that he did originally as collages in the early 1920s and was exhibited to great acclaim at that time. Um, and it was so popular that he created in 1926 a series um, of prints based on the original collages. Unfortunately, the collages were lost over time or destroyed, um, but the prints of course remain. And so we're, we're kind of including them as you know, hearkening back to the original collages. But I think he, he really maintained the aesthetic, that layered um, aesthetic in the prints as well that you'll, you'll see when you see them in person. Um, here, you've got one called the meeting, and you get the sense of kind of maybe red and a yellow form that are meeting, coming together. What happens when they interact? You get both kind of the orange in the center where they're overlapping. 
Um, but then also this wonderful vertical axis, um, this zigzagging um, bluish green form that really kind of ties the two together, suggests a dynamism to the meeting, and also suggests a sense of rotation. And this is not a shot that we did, although I wish we could have done installed them this way. I don't know that our registrars would have let us. <laughs> um, but when the revol revolving doors collage um, series, which was originally exhibited in Paris, it was on something like you see on the right, and the, the, um, the visitor could actually spin it like a revolving door and see the kind of interaction of all of these um, collages or prints as they moved around. Um, so that was it's kind of a nod to the original installation of the collages. One of my personal favorite pieces in the show um, is this collage that's on long-term loan to us um, by Estevan Vicente, who was a member, um, kind of a second generation member of the Abstract Expressionists, um, and who did this piece um, during a trip to Hawaii. Um, and it's pretty large scale. And when you see it in person, um, he's got these, these really just beautifully watercolored um, sheets of paper that he's torn and combined. They're just really glowing and luminous in person. And I think it calls to mind the lush colors that he encountered when he visited Hawaii uh, at that time. So I encourage you to, to seek that out when you see the show. And then we do have one local artist in the abstraction um, section, a contemporary artist called Felicia von Bork. Um, our piece in the mint on the left is called How to Mine the Past, and it's from a series that she did um, called How to Mine dot dot dot, and you'll see from the piece on the right, each one has a different uh, modifier for how to mine. Um, the piece on the left she talks about is really being about the creative process, about the artist kind of being a factory for ideas and going back to one's past memories and, and kind of processing them to create artistic um, inspiration. On the right, the piece called How to Elope, um, you get this sense of this little kind of colorful form that's floating through that blue space. She talks about it almost like it's escaping through a window uh, in, in the composition. And that, that multicolor little um, grid there uh, relates to a scrapbook that she keeps of interesting colors that she um, kind of makes notes of and collects as she goes about in the world. Um, so we borrowed that from her to include in the show. And then we have two smaller pieces by her as well that touch on kind of different kind of emotional qualities she's able to, to capture in her work. On the left is one called How to Be Remembered and on the right is how to repress. And I just, I like that contrast with the kind of the darkness and that sense of kind of teeth and that beast-like form on, in the how to repress. Now it contrasts with kind of the lightness and delicacy of, of how to be remembered. Um, and you can see them, uh, well, well, actually, she's one where we have um, some, some process shots. What she does is she actually starts with monographs. She's a really great printmaker. And so on the left there is one of her monographs that she, she creates as her kind of starting material. She then, um, as you can see on the right, takes all these monographs, lays them on the floor, cuts them up. And so that kind of the act of um, destruction is part of the process of renewal and creation for her. On the, on the left there in that shot, you can see her scrapbook of colors um, that was kind of referenced flying out the window and how to elope. Um, so then she starts to kind of cut little strips and starts to piece things together. And there's a, a photograph of her working away in her studio. Um, so it, there's, you know, this her, her collages are really a two-part process. It's creation of a monograph and then taking those monographs and recombining them into her, her new abstractions. And here are um, the four pieces uh, installed at the Hunter um, here on the right, and then the other three on the left. Text has um, long been a part of collage. I, I referenced Le Echo in that Brock um, piece that we saw earlier on. Uh, again, here in Hannah Hooks, you can see how the words Dada are echoing um, the, the, the anti-Dada, Dada down below. It's kind of echoing throughout her piece, um, referencing the movement she's a part of. Uh, and here again with the echo in, in Brock. Um, so text did play a role oftentimes in collage and that kind of bringing in newspapers and other elements of contemporary life add meaning to the pieces. And it's something that echoes throughout the collages in our own collection as well. Um, this is a piece we actually acquired just before the exhibition um, through Wells Fargo's generosity. They helped provide some funds to grow our collection, which is always welcome. Um, this is a piece by Lauren McEver, who is really probably better known as um, an abstract expressionist painter. Um, she was one of the first women to have her abstract expressionist work shown and acquired at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, but I was really drawn to this piece just because of the ties back to collage in, the, in, in our collection. It's called Rue Mouffetard, La Mouffe. Um, 
that was a street in Paris where she spent some time living and working in the 1960s. And so you can see it's a very vertical piece. And you can see that this kind of form in the center there, like a street winding through. And so what she's done is, is to create um, you know, an abstract map of the street that she lived and worked on. And all along the sides of it are different bits that maybe reflect shops or other things that were along the street. And so I've done this little detail here um, in the upper right. Uh, you can see there's a little bouquet of flowers. So perhaps that might've been where a, a florist shop was um, along the street. But you know, really interesting use of, of text. And again, the text in French from all the newspapers and, and materials she, that she collected there, um, kind of referencing back the source where she made it. Um, now these obviously are not collages. Um, these are two of probably the best known pieces that any school child who's been to the Mint in Charlotte will tell you that they re remember from visiting the museum. Um, two grand portraits by Alan Ramsey of Queen Charlotte, the namesake of our city and King George that are kind of cornerstones of our collection. These are always on view at our original museum at Mint, Mint Museum Randolph. When we were opening the new building, we wanted to have something to connect the new museum to the old. And so we commissioned a piece by Ken Aptekar called Charlotte, Charlotte. Um, Aptekar came to the city, and this was at a time when um, Queen Charlotte's um, background was really being uh, investigated and her kind of multi, uh, her, her different, you know, uh, different sources of all of her um, kind of her ethnicity were, were being talked about. Um, and so he, Aptekar really dug in, did a lot of interviews with people in Charlotte about um, how they felt about kind of the woman for whom we were named. And he took all of those, all of the responses to those and incorporated them into sandblasted glass panels that sit atop of details that he recreated of, of the painting that people talked about um, that were their favorite parts of it. So you see on the upper left panel, um, the text black, white, other. Um, on the right, immigrant, um, Charlotte came to uh, Great Britain, she was Charlotte of Mecklenburg, so she came from, from Germany, so she was kind of a, an immigrant to, um, to England at that time, just as uh, Charlotte itself is now a city with people coming from many different places. Um, down here, Queen of the Enemy, referring to her role as queen during the American Revolution uh, and others, so just a nice piece to kind of tie together past and present in the city's history that we commissioned. Another big piece you'll see in the show is by Tim Rollins and Kids of Survival. Um, Tim Rollins was an artist who worked collaboratively with um, children in at-risk communities to create um, kind of works of art together with them. This piece is based on the text of Franz Kafka's uh, book, America. Um, this is from chapter nine, and the text references um, the sound of your voice as a, as a golden instrument. And so I think Rollins worked with youth in Charlotte to think about what would their voice look like it was, if it was represented as an instrument. So in the background, there are um, pages from the chapters of the book. And on top of that uh, are layered paintings by the kids um, that he was working with. And here's a, a process shot of it, piece in creation. And we also explored photography, which was um, kind of tied to um, the medium of collage in some really interesting ways. Uh, there are a number of pieces by Christina Rogers, who is a Charlotte-based photographer. And she really, um, all of her pieces have both photography and collage incorporated into them in some way on the left, um, using lots of different photographs of one scene to create this kind of composite image of New York there. Uh, on the right, uh, a more personal piece, um, exploring her own background, where you can see she's, um, the background itself is made up of uh, a number of collage photographs, some of which were created through layering negatives on top of each other. So kind of collaging in the process of creating a new photograph. Um, she's also brought in images of her home city in uh, Germany where her family was from. There's a postage stamp in there, um, all sorts of other bits of, of other collage photographs. So she's kind of coming at this idea of collage in a couple different ways in this one work. And there's also a large photograph by contemporary Italian artist, Loris Ciccini. Um, this is kind of looking at collage and photography in a new digital way. So Ciccini, what he would do would be to go out and take pictures of people on the streets um, around his village, or city and town that he lived in or as he was traveling. Um, what he would then do is create little landscapes in his studio. This one's made of actually soap bubbles and green peppercorns. And he would then um, kind of take that play with scale, collage digitally the people from um, his kind of journeys around his town or on his travels into that landscape at vastly different scales to create these kind of surreal um, scenes. 
And when you see this in person, on top of it is actually a, another layer of bubbled plexiglass that's kind of playing off of the bubbles in the piece. Um, so adding to that, another layer to that collage sense. And then finally, in the photography section, uh, a piece by local artist Merrick Reynas um, on the left is, is at the actual piece in the show. It's, a, again, a digital collage of his hometown. A lot of the work he does explores both the legacy of World War II, of colonialism, of um, violence. And so it's a kind of old aerial photograph of his hometown in, in Poland that was destroyed during bombings during World War II. And on top of it is this kind of strange looking um, image that almost seems like a mushroom cloud exploding upward. It's actually an abstraction um, of one of his sculptural pieces. Um, this is another piece in our collection, one of his sculptures on the right. It's uh, an image of Napoleon who's kind of sinking down uh, into um, what Mer Merrick calls an iceberg-like form lurking under the surface and Napoleon's just the tip. Um, so I think he's kind of taken, he's taken one of these um, images of his sculptures and abstracted it to become this kind of explosion on top of the, the scene of his hometown. But digital collage, um, uh, definitely a new, a new realm um, for, for straight photography and kind of digital photography as well. Um, so looking into other media, um, here's the Bearden collage we saw at first, um, which is itself an actual collage, but then Bearden pushed it into printmaking. He, he loved to explore printmaking, and you can see he's taken um, in the image on the right, the original train collage, um, done it as a print, but played with tones, played with color to start to begin to abstract it. So you can still pick out in this one, the figures in the scene, but he's dropped out the blacks and, and kind of done a fade of, of reds down to blues kept some of the lighter tones. From that one, um, you can see how he's played with it again in a different print, abstracting even more. Um, so on the, the one on the right, um, you really have to struggle to pick out the scene anymore. It's become almost completely abstract. Um, he's eliminated now the white tones as well, um, substituted those with, with greens, and then just done kind of a yellow and lavender on top of that. Um, so really kind of taking the collage as his base source and then abstracting it further and further. There's also two pieces by Annie Lemansky um, called Blue Go-Go Skeleton. And here she is, um, an in-process shot. She would, she loved um, kind of the early children's um, encyclopedias. And so she um, had some from her youth that she liked to take and kind of cut up and recombine. Um, so on the left is what is the actual collage in the show. But then she loved to take them um, and blow them up into larger scale um, prints. So here's a series of those prints seen in one of her exhibitions. You can see the large print there on the on the left. Um, and then here in the Hunter's installation, you can see the two of them uh, down on the wall. What I love about these is when you see them in person, she's really taking care to kind of keep the, the dark outlines a lot around all of the forms when she made it a print. So it's very much still referencing back that collage as the initial source. And then speaking of other mediums, um, a, a definitely audience favorite at, at our museum is this piece by uh, Iruka Maria Toro. Now this is a pure painting. Um, Toro does do collages as, as studies and as another form of her practice, but this is purely a painting, but I think she's really drawing on the aesthetic of collage to create it. Um, and so you can see all different kinds of forms and, and the figure, she, she reads this, um, it doesn't look like her, but she talks about it as a self-portrait kind of swimming through the center of, of this space. Um, she made this piece just after she had A, done her first um, scuba diving experience and B, moved from Florida to upstate New York. And so the scuba is referenced, of course, by the kind of aquatic nature of it all um, and by the octopus that you see down here. And then the forms of, um, kind of the bunnies and some of the flowers referencing kind of the new things she was ex experiencing when she moved to um, upstate New York. She also talked about kind of the, the kind of triangular board-like structure floating above her as referencing uh, her and her husband were building a house at that time. It's referencing that idea of construction. And then just above her, red body there, you can see two, these two little spiraling forms, these are snakes. And she talks about them, they're existing kind of separate, but in parallel. And she talks about that um, harking back to her and her husband um, as kind of symbolically being referenced as their new uh, marriage together. Um, so a really fun piece to, to look at with kids and find all sorts of things um, in the image. And then at the end of moving from one thing to another, um, we have three pieces by Sam Gilliam in the show. And this kind of brings us into the last section, uh, looking at moving from collage to assemblage. And Gilliam really incorporates a lot of the things we've been talking about uh, into these pieces. On the left is his composition around violet, um, which is really kind of an, an abstract meditation on the color, 
violet and all how it relates to different colors. Um, now, now, not only are um, in this piece are the bits of canvas layered one on top of the other um, to create this collage, um, but the piece on the lower left is actually a later addition that was then again added onto it. Um, that Gilliam was commissioned to create a, an installation for our atrium space um, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And when he came, he saw this piece in their collection and he added on that little corner piece to it um, to give it a more, to add in a little bit of more contemporary feel to it. It's done on metal as opposed to um, fabric, but you know, he's kind of he's still kind of adding on to it, collaging onto uh, the original piece. On the right, there is a print done about the same time um, as composition around violet, where you can see again, kind of him experimenting with layering different forms and textures and colors on top of each other. And then on the right is um, a piece called Reflection to Little Miss Cole. Um, Miss Cole refers to Kevin Cole's daughter. Um, Kevin Cole is one of Gilliam's um, students who is inspired by his work. And um, what's interesting here is Gilliam's really moving into three dimensions. Um, this piece has lots of different um, layers to it and the addition of mirrors as well that are sitting on top of the surface that not only um, kind of provide a dimensionality to it, but also bring the viewer into the piece in a really interesting way. And so that finally brings us into assemblage or collage kind of coming into three dimensions. Um, that too has kind of a long history within art history from Picasso's guitar sculptural construction there from 1914. Um, to Kurt Schwitter's in 1921, part of the kind of Dada movement um, called uh, Picture 46A, the Skittle picture. Um, Skittles being a, a game, like a miniature bowling game. So you see the little Skittle-like forms that are included there, different states of standing up and being knocked over. And then the probably best known Joseph Cornell. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any Cornell in our collection, but um, famous for creating his, his wonderful box um, environments. Um, so we're here, just a quick view of three of the assemblage pieces in the show, kind of riffing on Cornell in the box, uh, Joe Brainerd's Madonna and Child there, which includes everything from seashells to a plastic fried egg to cigarette butts and bow ties. <laughs> so that'll be fun for you to look at. Um, Willie Little's piece, The Blocks Tell the Story, uh, and then Radcliffe Bailey's Middle Passage, which um, is a really poignant piece that refers to um, the dangerous, often deadly passage um, on slave ships um, during the transatlantic slave trade, which are referenced not only in some of the imagery that you see in the piece, but then also um, in the chain and, and shackle that um, hang down from it. Um, one last piece that I'll end with was another one that we actually commissioned for the exhibition um, by Sheila Gallagher. Um, and again, Wells Fargo generously supported us going out in the limb and, and commissioning this piece. Um, this is not the piece that's in the show. This is what inspired us to commission it and was included in an exhibition that we hosted um, back in 2013 called State of the Art. Um, so here's an installation shot of it there. It's called um, Plastic Lila. And it's this wonderful kind of floral tapestry. And there's a detail of it on the right, which is fascinating. And we'll learn more about how it's made in a moment. Um, so this is the piece that we ended up commissioning from Sheila. Um, called Ghost Orchid Plastic Nebulae. Again, it relates back to um, kind of the floral tapestry-like imagery that, that Gallagher um, included um, in, in Plastic uh, Lila. Now the piece is created in a really fascinating way. Um, Gallagher is really interested in kind of recycling and using unusual materials in her work. So all of her pieces are made of melted plastic. And she talks about how she kind of stalks her neighbor's alleys um, on recycling day and collects all of these things that we might normally otherwise cast off. Um, so here on the left is her collection of pill bottles and yogurt containers and cookie molds and all sorts of other things. On, on the right, um, you can see sometimes she kind of sorts them out by color um, and, and form. Sometimes she clips letters out of things and works text into her um, pieces. And so for our piece, um, she was interested in that kind of juxtaposition between um, Kind of the environment and uh, collecting things to, that um, you know people are not throwing away but recycling, trying to help the environment, and also things um, a subject that was endangered. And so the ghost orchid uh, kind of inspired her to think about other delicate, beautiful plants um, that are currently kind of endangered or fragile. And so here's some of the plant-like imagery that she was inspired by as she created our piece. Um, and here on the left, you can see her kind of taking some of the plastic and laying it out. I'm getting ready to create. And on the right, you can see how the colors and the forms relate back to the photographic sources. 
Um, and then again on the right is one of the bits of her composition after everything has kind of been melted together and, and flown and flowed together. Um, sometimes she would lay things out, even just kind of very specifically yellow and purple, two of the colors of the flowers. Um, there's even bits of cut, cut up credit cards that you can find in some of her compositions. Um, one of them is her gallery's credit card, which I thought was funny. So see if you can see that in our piece. Um, now how does she melt them together? She actually grills them. Um, so she lays out the compositions on baking sheets and um, you know, very carefully avoiding the toxins, as you can see there, um, fires up the grill and melts them together. And she talks about how as she's explored this process, she discovered she can create different effects. Some plastics are thinner, they melt um, more easily and more liquidy. Others will bond to the surface, but you know, maintain a lot of their form. Um, so you can find everything in her works from bottle caps to Lego pieces, to toothbrushes um, and more. Um, so here's our piece partly composed as she had it laid out. You can see the parts at the bottom are kind of melted together and ready to be joined. Um, and then above they're laid out in the baking sheet ready to be baked. Um, so I thought that was a kind of a really great way to kind of see our piece in process there. So I will end there, um, but I will encourage you to visit the show if you can, um, as you feel safe. It's great that um, museums can, can be open to limited visitorship. Um, it's Nothing made me happier than seeing people in our galleries again. Um, look closely at what you see. And I say that um, illustrating Kojo Griffin's piece there. One of the really fun things for me in organizing the show is really mining our collection and looking at it in a new way through the lens of collage. Um, this piece by Kojo Griffin, I always thought was just a painting. But when I looked really closely at it, I noticed there were a couple of different elements that were collaged onto it very um, in a, you know, they're very thin and it was done in a, in a, in a really um, discreet way. So don't look too closely because I'm sure that the guards at the Hunter and the registrars would not like you to look, get too close, but see if you can find uh, in this piece um, where it's collaged. And most of all, enjoy. Um, it's a really fun show and it really re rewards a lot of looking. Um, so with, with that, um, I know Natalie has um, Maybe some questions. Do audience members have questions? Um, have Absolutely. Jonathan, thank you so much. This was um, such an incredible talk, such a great way to spend an evening. And, and thank, thank you, you so much for all these insights into um, a medium that feels um, like you've you've seen it, but um, you know, really your lecture makes me want to go back and, and re-experience <laughs> this, this exhibition that we've kind of um, as part of the Hunter staff have really been immersed in in the past three weeks. Um, so we've had one uh, comment come in and they're hoping that you can maybe go back a slide um, to see, kind of spend a little bit more time with this Sheila Gallagher. And, sure, And sure. Um, kind of echoing that uh, great sentiment about seeing these works in person. Um, I mean, these images on the screen look incredible, but absolutely seeing them in person makes a world of difference. And this in um, the show at the Hunter Museum mm -hmm. is actually one of the first pieces that you will encounter. Oh, great. So, um, so it's it's pretty great way to to kind of enter into that space. Yeah, and I really like the way that you all have kind of explored. I mean, there are obviously a lot of intersections. I mean, some pieces in one section could easily be in another. Um, so it's nice that you have a lot of nice um, moments within the show where one idea kind of leads into the next. Um, and I think, you know, with this one, there, there's text in it, it's dimensional, it's incorporating lots of different elements, it's kind of abstract, there's kind of a narrative. Um, so it does kind of play with a lot of those ideas. Um, but was there something specific about this or we just wanted to look at it more? <laughs> Um, I think it was just people wanted to see it. Um, yeah. um, I mean, I especially love this piece. You being a Louisiana girl myself, this feels very um, in in key with Mardi Gras and this kind of season that we're in right now. So, so this is great. Thank you. Um, we did have a couple questions from mm -hmm. viewers. Um, one of the questions um, that somebody asked was, "What were some of the biggest challenges with organizing and all throw in and traveling and?" <laughs> exhibition on collage? Sure. Um, well, the, you know, there's certainly, the pieces are fragile um, because, you know, we had to make sure everything, in particular, let me go back a little bit there. That Brainerd piece on the, on the left there, uh, the Madonna and Child, there's, it's old enough and there's so many different elements of it. We had it conserved before it came, um, before it traveled actually before we displayed it and then again before it traveled. Um, but, you know, a lot of the time the artists are using materials to adhere things that kind of decay and, and might break down over time. Um, and so actually 
if you look at Brainerd, there's a website for Brainerd. Even since it's been at the Mint, this piece, you know, there used to be like a little bit of fringe hanging down from it that's you know, vanished by the time I got to the Mint. Um, so I think, you know, these are fragile pieces. And so it was, um, I'm really thrilled that we were able to travel them and get, get them out to be seen. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, so many of them are works on paper and so they don't, you know, get out that often. Or if, if they're Bearden's, we do use them to rotate in our Bearden gallery. So we had to kind of make sure that things hadn't been out that much before they, they traveled around and were on view for a while. Um, but then again, it was fun to kind of jump into in the organizational process to kind of jump in and look at all of the different kind of branches on the tree of collage, so to speak, that, that, you know, it really extended into so many different forms of artistic practice, even, you know, into, um, the digital era. I mean, when we, when we had the show in Charlotte, we had a little kind of, uh, a, a very contemporary new direction section where we, we brought in loans, not from our collection by a couple different contemporary artists. And some of those were digital video pieces where the artists were still using that aesthetic. Um, so I think it was just, it was fascinating for me to think about, you know, kind of dive deeply in, into the medium of, of collage and think of the different ways that it's, it's impacted um, contemporary art. Um, um, to kind of go back a little bit to the work by Sheila Gallagher, mm -hmm. um, we had somebody ask if you could explain a little bit more about, um, I guess, the fascination between how the pieces are actually joined together. Right. So I think you can probably see this is a shot of the whole piece. You can probably even see in here, if you can see my mouse, kind of where the divisions are. Um, so she kind of, you know, bakes each one on the baking sheet. And then I think from behind blowtorches them meld them together. Um, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, the, each piece kind of, if you were to break it into what, it's 12 or 16 individual components, they would all kind of hold together on their own. And then each of those, you know, those are all kind of combined together on an armature um, and, and melted together as well. That's, it's fascinating. I don't know if I am um, seeing the work in person. I don't know if I noticed all of the ways that it was um, attached, but again, this is such a beautiful piece. Um, I, I'm not surprised that I was more <laughs> entranced by, you know, the overall work and then trying yeah. to find those little details. We did see the, um, the credit card and parts of the credit card. That was, that yeah. was pretty funny. <laughs> So. Well, it was it was interesting. Uh, reflecting back, we did host. You know, State of the Art was a big survey of contemporary art in America that was organized by the Crystal Bridges Museum that we hosted. Um, and looking back, when we were thinking about, you know, we had this ability to, to commission something. We were looking back at um, a couple of different artists in that show, and it was interesting to see how prevalent that idea of of collage was, even within that exhibition. You know, there were definitely six or eight different artists who we could have gone to who are all kind of exploring different ideas. You know, ideas related to collage in their work. Um, and and you know, we kind of came back to Sheila just because of her unique approach to materials and the, the fact that it was just such a, a fun audience favorite, but also, you know, it touches on you know, some really important issues on recycling, on the environment, um, and on, um, you know, in a couple of different ways. So. Absolutely. In fact, a comment that just came in said, um, just an observation, many of these tap into a disruptive nature, even activism. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, collage, I think that's why the surrealists loved it. I mean, this idea that you're bringing together things from different places um, with different meanings, and then kind of like crashing them all together um, to create something new. Um, I think that, that, you know, it fits right in with what the surrealists and the data artists were, were so interested in, um, kind of disrupting disrupting life. And I think, you know, a lot of, you know, things in the show, um, you know, kind of carry on that spirit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jonathan, beyond any kind of questions, you know, most people's comments here this evening were just, you know, general statements about how beautiful or how lovely something worked. And, <laughs> and we had so many comments to say, you know, thank you so much for joining us. And, yeah, and I course. really do. I want to thank you so much for giving this um, incredible behind the scenes look at under construction. I really cannot wait to get back into the <laughs> exhibition with the new insights you gave this evening. Good. Yeah. Hopefully it'd be helpful for tours and, and other things. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Um, I also want to thank again, our generous sponsors, um, EMJ Construction and Wells Fargo for their support of under construction and to Martha Mackey for her support of ArtWise programs, including this evening's fascinating insight into the Hunter's latest exhibition. 
And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, we will have uh, related programs um, affiliated with the Under Construction Exhibition. You can find them on our website, huntermuseum.org. And we also have um, a list of them in the chat. Um, two of the artists will be speaking during the duration of the exhibition. Um, as a reminder, Under Construction Collage from the Mint Museum will be on view at the Hunter Museum from January January 29th through April 18th. We do hope you enjoyed your evening and come see this remarkable exhibition for yourself in the near future. Um, thank you again to our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Stillman, um, the Mitt Museum's Curator of American Art, and to all for attending.